The talk today is called, If You Can't Clean It, Don't Buy It. And it's a scientific study on the impact of furniture and infection prevention and control, or IPC as I like to call it. So, as I was saying, furniture for most of you, when it comes to infection prevention and control, probably fits in the yada, yada, yada column. So we're talking about hydrogen peroxide disinfection, and we're talking about bed and linens, and we're talking about C. difficile, and yada, 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 and somewhere in there is furniture. Of course, PIDAC would not agree with you, because if you look at these two documents, it actually talks about furniture. And the whole point is that even though it happens to be low-touch and non-critical, it does still play a role in being able to prevent infections from spreading from one person to another. What do you want to do for furnishings? Well, according to PIDAC, you want to choose finishes, furnishings, and equipment that are cleanable. Pretty obvious. You want to ensure compatibility of the healthcare settings, cleaning and disinfecting agents with the items and surfaces to be cleaned. In other words, if you use it, it shouldn't eat the fabric. And of course, you want to identify when items no longer become clean due to damage, i.e., if you have a rip or tear in the fabric, it's probably a good opportunity for you not to use it anymore. So, when it comes to textiles and furniture, it's interesting. Um, the first article up at the top left there is from actually May of 1918, where it was actually talking about uh, lousiness, which has nothing to do with your behavior and actually everything to do with bed bugs. Um, when you had the flu, the Spanish flu, you had high rapid turnover of people. And what ended up happening was that those people would leave behind something in the textiles and the fabrics. And then that would actually end up transferring to the next person, much like what we were just talking about in the previous discussion. Well, over the years, they found that textiles and furniture are not only a haven for louse, lice, bed bugs, but also for microbes. And before you knew it, you actually realized that these organisms were actually contributing to the spread of infections. So while you might be washing your hands absolutely perfectly, remember that for the next few seconds, if you are not keeping your fabrics, your textiles, and your furniture clean, you're actually doing yourself no favor. So you need to have proper cleaning to ensure proper prevention. And what's really interesting is that it didn't really get into infection prevention control until about 1986. And uh, Mary Langford and a number of others actually started looking at what type of materials could be used and what are the implications for bacterial survival and transmission. And what they found, really, was that, first off, nobody does it the same. I mean, how many people here have an actual standard operating protocol for washing furniture? Washing bed linens? Washing your clothes? Washing your hands. That's my point. And then, of course, furniture and furnishings make for a difficult challenge, even worse than some of the challenges that you face today in your healthcare environment. And there's two reasons for that. The first one, of course, is compliance. Um, the other one is actually the ability to wash your fabrics. Hot water, you know, specific types of uh, detergents, all of that stuff, right? Makes it pretty difficult, doesn't it? Makes you almost want to tear your hair out. What happens if you actually wash it? Well, what ends up actually happening is, as you can see in this particular demonstration here, you might be able to get it clean, but unfortunately it ends up something like Kramer after a short shower. So at the end of the day, what you have to do is not only do you have to comply to what the PIDAC was saying, but there's a couple of other things you need to put into consideration. One is obviously the cleanability, which is you have to have that compatibility and it has to be fast and efficient, and it also needs to be able to be dry, because no one wants a wet seat, well, at least in a healthcare facility. Um, you want to not provide microbial growth. Now, wood and cotton, as we found out from 1918 and on, that, that supports growth. Plastic and steel seems to be very good. Now, surface porosity, um, getting a little bit chemical here, the whole idea of having those little pits inside your surface. <clears throat> well, if the pits happen to be larger than you know, two microns in size, then an E. coli can sit there, an E. coli can grow there, an E. coli can form a biofilm there. So you want to make sure that you want to reduce that porosity. And of course, something that a lot of people don't think about is the absence of seams. I mean, how many of you have seams in your pants right now? 
Okay, how many of you have seams in the chairs that you're sitting on at the moment? And how many of you have seams in your arms and legs as a result of recent surgery? How many of your patients have seams as a result of recent surgery? And how many of them get infected as a result? You want to not have seams. And people have actually put in the whole idea of using these joining fabrics, seamless fabrics. And, and they're fascinating. You know, they provide that consistent flat surface. They mitigate those porosity concerns. You know, you can clean them with that worry of residue. You can produce them with today's technology. It's fairly easy. You just go down to the place in North Carolina. It's all made up. You get a really nice chair. And it may offer a means for improved infection prevention. Unfortunately, they cost a fortune. And that's a major problem. Because if you all of a sudden want to start redeveloping your entire you know, healthcare facility, you have to not only look for the long term, but you also have to look in the bit of the short term. And I know some of the people who essentially are the CAOs when it comes to these hospitals. I mean, I, I worked with uh, Ottawa Hospital from 2002 to about 2009. They're not particularly keen on these types of things. So there are other approaches. And one of the best ones that have come out um, is, is the concept of surface coatings. Now, how many of you have ever heard of a surface coating? How many of you have ever used polish on your table to prevent scratches? That's a surface coating. The difference is, over the last number of years, we've changed that surface coating from oil, wax, and grease. <laughs> I mean, they're wonderful. They really work, just not to prevent infections to other things. And one of them was PVCs. And I, I don't know how many of you remember the old, good old environmental days of the late 1970s, but the PVCs actually created something called a phthalate. And that's, you know, cancerous, toxic, it's kind of a bad thing. And so now, of course, we want to try and avoid PVCs, we want to avoid phthalates, we want to avoid phosphates, we want to avoid all of these wonderful chemicals that could potentially kill us in the environment. Um, puncture and tear resistant, right? You don't want to have something that's going to get punctured because if you do, then you've created an inadvertent seam and that's where you can actually have things that can happen. And then of course, if it's possible, you want to have a coating that offers you some kind of antimicrobial property. And can you think of one particular chemical that may actually meet all of these recommendations? You say, PU. <laughs> This actually is a really, really cool molecule. Because not only does it offer seamless coating, and it offers you something that is durable, non-porous, resistant to microbial colonization, as I've been told to say by my friends at HealthCentric. But what I want to say about polyurethane is the fact that if you see the chemical right there, you see what we call an ester group, which is the C with the two, uh, the double bonded O and then the O to the side. <coughs> that is a, what we call an, uh, an electron and proton hog. What that does is it essentially takes any microbe's proton motor force, which, which is essentially what it needs to survive, and it steals all of those protons and electrons from the bacterium because it's saying, I like it. And then all of a sudden, the microbes have a very difficult time surviving. So there's actually a bit of an antimicrobial nature to it. And one paper that comes from 1975 actually showed that if you autoclave polyurethane, you kill everything for weeks afterwards. Because it created these amazing fatty amines and these great oxygen radicals. And that's basically what you're seeing here with this particular molecule. So if you add this polyurethane and then you heat it up to over 70 degrees Celsius, you've just created an antimicrobial. So now let's have some fun and let's look at the study. Uh, for which the subject of this talk is about. It was done by antimicrobial test laboratories, done by our friends here at Todd Centric. And it's very, very, very simple. Okay? And what it's going to do is it's going to find out whether or not a coating, a polyurethane coating, can actually improve our ability 
to prevent infection spread. What they did is they actually spread a certain amount of this 2 mils, 0.02 mils of a 10 to the 8 solution, allow it to dry for 45 minutes. You then clean it just with a nice disinfectant wipe. In this particular case, they use cavities. You neutralize it after three minutes, and then you find out how much was left over. So this is what they did. They took a good old-fashioned piece of hospital-grade vinyl, seams and everything, and they took another one which was coated with PU. Did it in duplicate. So when you see control one, control two, that's just hospital-grade vinyl. P1, P2, those are essentially the polyurethane coated. And what you have here is a log reduction scale. Now, for anyone who's done basic white tests, according to ASTM, you would expect to see anywhere from a 0.3 to a 0.5 log reduction as a result of simple wiping, just with a right general dis detergent or disinfectant. And that's what we see with the control. Then, all of a sudden, you add a coating, and before you know it, you're up to three log reduction. Now, <clears throat> if I was to normally take some kind of coating and I would wipe it, I'd marginally see a little bit of an increase. Maybe 0.5, maybe one log more reduction. This here, that's why I'm here. Because when they send me this data, I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. Fact is, that polyurethane coating basically wiped out whatever type of load you would expect to see. <clears throat> because literally, unless someone explodes onto a chair, you're not going to see more than about a thousand CFU of any type of bug per centimeter squared, or I should say per decimeter. Just to give you an idea, the fabric was cleanable. So you could clean the fabric, okay? And it did not support microbial growth and controls. In other words, you didn't see an increase in the bacteria as a result of just letting it sit there for 45 minutes. But what the coating did is because it reduced the presence of seams, it reduced the presence of porosity, and it seemed like it had those lovely oxygen molecules, it actually exhibited something that provided you with an antimicrobial effect that you would not normally see if you were just simply given it a glass coating and wiped it. And I know that from my own experiences in the laboratories. What it did then show is that not only is it impressive, it's also PIDAC compliant because it basically fits everything I talked about at the beginning that you've probably forgotten by now. Uh, furniture continues to be a challenge in infection control. PIDAC has that specific section to address the issue. And coatings offer an alternative option. And PU has been effective for over 40 years. And now we see that PU seems to be having an increased ability in being able to help us spread, uh, prevent the spread of infections. Coatings, obviously, we know now for 30 years, provide increased cost efficiency or cost efficacy, depending on how fast you spend it. Um, and you can actually have upwards of a decade of use without loss of function. So basically, as soon as you create those lovely amines and those lovely oxygen molecules, you're pretty much good for a decade. And of course, it's very easy to clean because there's no seams, there's no pores. One good wipe. No contact time needed. How many of you actually know whether or not your environmental staff actually leave it for three minutes when they're doing a contact time? How many of you believe that they don't do it for three minutes when there's a contact time? <laughs> it's easy to clean and it's also time saving so that when you actually have an eight hour shift, it's an eight hour shift and you're not having to worry about cleaning a chair making eight and a half hours. It's also what we call passive. And passive disinfection is clearly becoming a greater importance in multimodal approaches. I was at APEC earlier this year, and the whole idea of passive disinfection was starting to really make a difference. Well, this is one way that you can look at passive disinfection as being able to help you rather than just simply you know, force you to do something else that you just don't want to do or you know that no one else is going to do anyways. And more, even though my friend Didier Pitt at the WHO will hate me, you don't have to monitor this. So Clint will like me. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. And, uh,